In this lesson we're going to take a look at Elizabeth Barrett Browning's sonnet 43. So um, you might notice if you study a few sonnets that quite often they're numbered rather than um, having like their own title, they're just called sonnet, number, whatever, by whoever. Shakespeare does this, quite a lot of writers, poets do this, so um, yeah usually the way we identify a sonnet that's numbered is we just look at that first line. So sometimes you might see it being called this, how do I love thee, let me count the ways. Um, yeah, I thought I'd just mention that before we start in case you're wondering why it doesn't have a real title compared to other poems. So we're going to begin with having a look at a few little vocab words. There's not too much difficult vocab in this one to be honest. Um, the only ones I really picked up on are the, which is an old-fashioned word for you, breadth, which means like width basically, how broad something is, how wide it is, and grace, which has a double meaning of elegance, like if you're a graceful person, like a ballerina or something, you can move about in this sort of beautiful way, or goodness, which means kind of, um, a sort of like spiritual goodness within your nature. And if you analyse that word grace, it's really good to talk about both those meanings. So double meanings are a really good thing to talk about in essays because they get you into like layers of analysis, they help you explore alternative interpretations, that kind of thing. So if you can ever find a word in a poem or to any kind of text with double meanings, always zoom in and analyse that word if you can. So I'm going to really quickly read the poem and um, yeah, and you can kind of experience the sound of it. It's important to always read poems aloud, as I'm always saying in my in my lessons. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll read it for you, but do read it on your own aloud to yourself, probably like three or four times at least per poem, um, you know, for fun <laughs> when you're bored. I don't know. I, I kind of do just read poetry when I'm bored if I don't really know what to read because it's quite quick and it's sort of, it's like entertaining. But yeah, for your, for your GCSE or your A-level or whatever you're studying this poem for, um, the more you read it aloud, the more you get used to sounds and patterns and you'll notice things that you wouldn't notice just reading it on the page. So yeah, I'll start. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach. When feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need, by sun and candle light. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with the love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath. Uh, breath, sorry, smiles, tears of all my life, and if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. So hopefully the first thing you noticed about this is that they love the person. <laughs> they love them, and they keep talking about how much they love them, and they repeat, I love thee. So that's a very easy little phrase quote for you to remember if you're doing an exam where you have to memorize your quotations. It's obviously an underscored message of the poem because it's repeated so much and we'll have a look at that when we look at techniques in a second. So even though it might seem quite obvious, it's obvious because she wants us to pick up on it that this is a really important message of this poem. Another thing we want to be sure about is it's not actually for us this poem. It's written for a specific person who is the recipient of this speaker's love. It probably is written um, from Elizabeth Barrett Browning to her husband, and we'll look at the context of that in a minute as well, but they had a very kind of crazy life that I'll, I'll talk about because I really love their life. They're really mental people because sometimes when you're just doing poetry, you don't actually have a picture of like who the poet is or what type of person they are. Um, yeah, for their time, Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Robert Browning, who you may also come across, both of them complete crazies and uh, very interesting, very much in love and very dedicated to each other. So they're kind of expressing this through the through the poem here. So um, 
yeah, the first thing we're going to do now then is have a look at the story and then we'll do some really in-depth analysis after that. So, it's a small story summary because all sonnets don't actually have a story to them, they just have an idea that they're exploring. So we call this a lyric poem. A lyric poem is something that is just exploring a concept, it's not actually like a full-blown story. So yeah, the speaker starts with a question, how do I love you? And then she decides to go through and count how she loves him. So it seems like a straightforward question, like how do I love you? If you thought about that with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or even anyone that you love, like your family, your friends, your dog. Um, yeah, if you asked, you know, how do you love them? You'd just be like, completely or I definitely love them or you know, it seems like a straightforward question, but the more she thinks about it, the, the less it's straightforward. And she's kind of trying to push that question to its limits, like physically, mentally, spiritually. She's looking for all the different ways in which you can love someone. So sonnets are really traditionally about love. And it's kind of interesting because we do quite often, if you don't really think about love, you think of it as this like flat thing, like, yeah, I love someone or I don't love them. And Everyone sort of has their own idea of what love is, but it's usually quite absolute and final and straightforward. Like either you love them, you're dedicated to them, or you don't love them and you're not dedicated. So we can kind of have this like very straightforward view of love sometimes, and she's trying to open that up. So your feeling when you read this poem might be it's really soppy and it's quite over the top. And I would agree with you, it is quite soppy and over the top, but it's also subtle in different ways. So it's it's still trying to find different ways that we feel love, trying to capture the human experience in its entirety and trying to explore what love actually is rather than just calling it this word, this big kind of big L love type thing. So she says first, she loves him as far as her soul can go. The depth, the breadth and the height, so how deep, how wide and how tall it can go. Then she loves him throughout the whole day, day and night, by sun and candlelight. So night or day, she loves him. So she's thinking about in terms of her soul, which is sort of representative of spirituality, the Victorians. And then she's thinking about how much she loves him uh, time-wise, so all hours of the day. She says she loves freely as men try and do what's right or fight for justice. So when she thinks about her feeling of love that she has for this man, she has this kind of same feeling that other people have when they're trying to fight for justice. So in a political sense, they feel like it's right and it's true and it's something for them to believe in. She has that kind of feeling with the love that she feels for him, which I think is quite nice, quite pretty. She loves him purely as men shy away from being praised. So that's quite an interesting image, isn't it? <laughs> like if you're if you're kind of shy and someone gives you a compliment and you're like, oh, thanks, or kind of awkward about it. She also feels that kind of love for this, for this guy. So it's really intense, but also it's kind of shy. She's a bit worried about expressing it directly. And that's partly kind of her nature, her personality. Partly that's Victorian culture, because it's actually quite a restrictive culture, the Victorians. They don't go around, like, you know, shouting their love from the rooftops like you might see in films nowadays. They have to be quite restricted with their emotions, and um, they're not, it doesn't, it's not a society that encourages you to, to feel very strongly about things. You try and keep your emotions in check so that you're, you're kind of refined. That's, that's the way Victorians think about things. So... She's kind of embarrassed almost about how strongly she feels in this society because it's not a society that encourages that. Um, and she loves him with the passion that she feels as strongly as things that she grieves. I don't know, if, I don't know what's going on with my grammar here. Maybe like this, I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes uh, Google Docs just tells me my grammar's wrong and I don't know why. I'm sure everyone can empathise with that. What was I saying? Yeah, so she feels really strongly in the same way that she feels strongly for things that she grieves. So she feel, you grieve when you've lost something, like something's died, a person or an animal, or you've lost something that you were close to. And how much faith she had as a child. 
So she's comparing love to really, really strong, very pure, all-consuming emotions like grief. If someone you, you were really close to died, you kind of get consumed. Most people get consumed by grief, especially Victorian culture. It's very um, important to grieve properly. So they encourage the grieving process, the mourning process. And faith as a child, so when, when you're a kid and people tell you Santa's real and you just totally believe it and you don't question it, or the tooth fairy, and it's like that very innocent, pure feeling where you're just sure <laughs> and you totally believe, that's kind of as strong as the feeling of love she has now. So she's exploring different emotions and how this feeling of love connects to those. She says she thought she'd lost the feeling of love, but she found it again with him, which I think is very sweet. Again, you might just think it's a bit a bit sickly and cloying and naff, <laughs> but I'm like, oh, that's cute, because, you know, she maybe was really idealistic about love at some point, and then it didn't work out, and she didn't think she'd ever love again, and now she's found it with this guy, so I think it's, it's cute. Um... At the end, she summarises the ideas of the poem in this list that we'll look at as well. So breath, smiles, tears. Breath is actually on a separate line, so if you are quoting that line, you want to just put a line break in there. I don't know why I didn't when I was making this page. But yeah, that little dash, it means there's a line break. Make sure you can do that with poetry. Because you can analyse that structurally and it's important to be quite accurate with how you're quoting. That type of stuff does make a difference if you're aiming for those top levels. So finally, she ends by saying she hopes that she gets to love him even more after death. So no matter how strong these feelings are in life, she wants. She thinks that after they're dead, it will be amplified. It's not like it's going to go away when they die. It's going to get 20 times better, which is a very hopeful and powerful message. Depends on your religious beliefs. So you might... Um, if you're not religious or you have a different religion from Christian, you might be thinking that makes no sense. Um, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about how Christians kind of conceptualise death versus how other religions or um, non-religious people might conceptualise death because your opinion on whether you still love someone after death de changed depending on um, your, own, your own religious beliefs. So when you analyse this, if your own beliefs had nothing to do with, you know, they're not matching up with what Elizabeth Barrett Browning's beliefs are, you can just analyse that uh, in a quite a complex way. So you can say a modern atheistic audience or a modern secular audience wouldn't quite interpret this correctly or that kind of thing. So it's, it's sometimes good if your opinions are quite different from the opinion of the poet. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Good. So hopefully you're okay with the ideas of the poem, the summary. I'm going to look a bit more at speaker and attitudes now. And um, I forgot to say this at the beginning of the lesson for some reason, but I'm always, I always try and say this at the beginning in case this is your only Scribbly lesson that you've seen. But the idea of Scribbly is just make notes and jot stuff down. It's kind of like in between a lesson and a lecture. So yeah, the idea is you just kind of make notes on stuff that's useful for you and your particular level that you're at, your particular reason for studying this poem. So feel free to jot down anything that I say or anything that's written on the page. And usually with um, any kind of course material like these documents that I make, I'll just upload them at the end as well. So you can print them off and look through at that point too, or even before lessons if you're taking multiple lessons. So yeah, speaker voice. The speaker is the person who's speaking in the poem, not necessarily the poet herself. But in this case, we kind of assume it is because her emotions are quite close to the emotions of the poet. So you do want to be a bit careful with that in essays, especially higher level essays. Don't just be like, the poet thinks this, the poet thinks that. You want to say the speaker, who we assume is the poet, or something like that. So you're just a little bit more careful about being aware that the speaker of a poem is not always the exact same as the writer themselves. It's like kind of... A, every poem is sort of spoken in character and even if a poet is speaking mostly from their character they're not going to give you all of their character they'll just give you one side or one aspect of it so um yeah the addressee is the person being spoken to so this is a poem for a private audience 
as I said before, this little bit here. So it's the it's the husband, basically, in this case. It's Robert Browning, who is also a poet. But it, it's for a private audience. It's not for just everyone to read. It probably would have been published in a way that everyone could read it. But initially, when she's writing it, she's thinking of her personal relationship with her husband. And she's using the second person pronoun, the, to address her husband directly. So attitudes, then. There are more attitudes, but I just kind of thought I'd pick up on the main attitudes that I kind of like get a feeling of straight away. So the first one's happiness. There's this like overwhelming sort of buzzy, overflowing, bubbling happiness to this poem. It's like too happy for me sometimes because I like things that are a bit more complex and shaded and I really like tragedy and dark stuff as well, as you'll notice if you take Macbeth or any of those types of courses with me. Um, but yeah, this one is not like Macbeth, it's not dark, it's just purely happy, very strongly positive. Um, it fully expresses the idea of love towards the addressee, and it kind of like gives herself and a lot of her thoughts and her emotions and her private feelings, it puts them down and it kind of conveys them to him in a way that, you know, you can, you get this energy that comes off it that shows you the extent of her feeling. And then, yeah, this is slightly slightly creepy maybe, but I always think poetry is really crazy because it's like a, sometimes like poems like this, they're just this kind of shot of pure emotion. And it's like this feeling someone had from 100 years ago and they just kind of shot it out of themselves in this poem. And when you read it, you get that like feeling of it. Sometimes if you're like a quite sensitive person, um, I get that and I find it really weird because it's like a little snippet of her character or her personality that we can feel now even though she's long dead. So this very positive kind of overflowing energy you get from it. Spirituality is another one. It's really important to her, the spiritual aspects of, of life. And um, even if you're not religious, you can still be spiritual. They're not the same thing at all. So um, yeah, so it's it's an interesting one that kind of invites us as secondary readers to explore our own spirituality alongside um, the poet's spirituality and kind of compare them. Like, do we have the same spiritual feelings about love or about the purpose of life and that kind of thing? So, I'm going to move on to language and structure and form. Again, with the language features, this is always the case with poems. Uh, I don't put everything there is to possibly say. When I was annotating poems myself for GCSE, A-level, for university, I did actually try and find absolutely every tiny little feature possible <laughs> and write about it and annotate it on my own poems. So I do recommend you do that as an extension of this lesson. But for the sake of keeping this not like, you know, not allowing this lesson to become crazy long, I've just picked out a few that I think are quite significant features. So the first one is occasionally we get little visual images that help us to understand what she's talking about. And this is quite common for sonnets in general. So you can actually mention that if you're analysing this in, in an essay that sonnets, because they explore these abstract ideas, sometimes they just like throw in little visual images to help us picture what is being expressed. So for example, one of these visual images by sun and candlelight. So sun is kind of like this bright, shining, all encompassing ball of light that creates a very intensively bright atmosphere. And the candlelight expresses another bright image of warmth, but it's very small and personal. I've actually written this in, so I'm going to It's a, a kind of like a point of light surrounded by darkness, whereas sunlight is, you know, the full bright light of the day. And hopefully while I'm explaining this to you, you're seeing that this is kind of like using symbolism. Um, so it's, it's kind of like literally she loves him in the daytime and the nighttime, as I was saying earlier. But it's also symbolically you know, when everything's going really well and it feels like there's just, she's surrounded by sunshine and there's this light everywhere. She still loves him a lot and she kind of feels like 
glowingly in love with him. And candlelight, which means that when most of her life's going really badly and she's sort of surrounded by darkness, she still loves him and it kind of feels like their love is this kind of glowing thing at the centre of it, even if everything else is kind of bad around that, which I think, again, is quite a beautiful image. So facial expression, smiles, tears, there's these kind of different emotions and feelings that she goes through as a character. And then she tries to sort of think about how her love stays constant no matter what mood she's in. Because love is like, it's different between, sort of the difference between a feeling and a mood, if that makes sense. I've not really thought about that before, but I guess love is like a feeling and that stays the same. Whereas a mood is something that changes. You can be in a happy or sad mood, smiles or tears. And love underneath that, the feeling of love is, is constant. So again, we have this idea of extreme. She loves him at the best and worst times of her life. Another one is um, repetition and anaphora. I actually explore this a bit more in the structure form because especially with anaphora, that is more of a structural point. So there's quite a lot of repetition, especially of the word love, especially of the word I love thee. And if you're not confident with anaphora, I would suggest you analyze repetition. But if you're aiming for really high levels, I would suggest instead of doing repetition, you do anaphora because that's a more specific technique that we'll look at in a second. And finally, for language features, a semantic field of religion. So this basically means that there are all these words that relate to the idea of religion. God, faith, praise, passion, soul, grace. It makes her seem faithful, which is important for a Victorian audience. She's faithful, dedicated as a person, and it maybe combines two passions of her life, so God and her husband. And it's not, she's trying to be respectful as well, so she's not saying my husband is like a God because that's kind of blasphemous and not a good idea to say in a Christian society. Um, but she's saying, you know, these strong feelings and like the passion I feel for my religion and my Christianity, I feel that same kind of emotions when I think about my husband and um, the man I chose to spend my life with. So she uses religious and spiritual imagery to describe love. So it feels like they're kind of crossing over. There's like not too much of a boundary between this really strong passion she has that she calls love and the strong passion she has that she calls religion. So it makes love seem holy, which is an important idea. And um, it makes us seem grateful to God that he's created this emotion, that he's allowed this man to be, you know, in her life and that kind of thing. So structure form then. I'm going to actually just put it all on one page so that it's easier for you to see. Here we go. So firstly, it's a sonnet, as I mentioned before. Always mention the fact that it's a sonnet, but don't just like kind of chuck it in there. Try and make sure you understand what a sonnet is and why this is a sonnet and that kind of thing. So it's a very structured form of poetry. Sonnets have this like regular rhythm to them. So they've got this 14 line uh, stanza. They're always one stanza. They are almost always on the theme of love, especially traditional sonnets like this one. This one is a particular sonnet called a Petrarchan sonnet. And if you're doing like aiming for high levels or you're doing A level and above, rather than just calling it a sonnet, make sure you know what Petrarchan means. Petrarchan just means this, it follows this pattern. So that's the rhyme scheme. A, B, B, A, C, D, D, C, E, F, E, F, E, F. So, it kind of gets faster as it goes along. You can see that it's got this like um, back and forth rhyme. So like A, B, B, A, C, D, D, C. Kind of like draws out the rhyming sounds across these first two quatrains, these first two um, groups of four lines. And then it gets faster, E, F, E, F, E, F. So maybe that represents her passion and the kind of speeding up of like her heart rhythm or her feelings when she's thinking about love. Um, it means it changes rhythm halfway through. So you can talk about that change in rhythm. 
we just have a really quick zoom back to the poem. This is your first quatrain, so that's your first four lines, so ways, height, sight, grace. And then we have days, light, bright, praise. So again, kind of dipping in and out. And then we have use faith, lose breath, choose death. So you can see how it like gets a little bit faster there and it kind of compounds and compresses towards the end. So we actually speed up our reading, which is a good thing to write down, that the speed of the poem gets faster. Um, with a Petrarchan sonnet especially, you get this like shift in tonal feeling Sometimes a shift in ideas in that second half, the bit that goes EF, EF, EF. So you can think about that as well. So anaphora then, this thing I was talking about earlier, it's, um, it's where she keeps saying I love thee, especially at the beginning of the sentence or the beginning of the line. So I want you to just note those times down and think about why is she repeating that phrase there. In my interpretation, it's an overflowing of emotion. She's just like so full of love, she just can't stop saying it. She just keeps going on and on. Um, and also, like, there's not enough words, I feel like. She's sort of frustrated a bit that, you know, saying I love you doesn't seem like enough to express this actual feeling that she has. So she has to repeat it and emphasize it and keep going back to it because it's very difficult to put into words the. Um, the extremity of her emotion, like how powerful that emotion is. So this is a rhetorical device. Um, and another rhetorical device is hypophora. So she's using quite a lot of rhetorical devices and these are technically used in um, important speeches, as it says here. So it's kind of like she's declaring something, she's giving a speech on love and she's prepared this kind of important thing to say that she's crafted into the form of a, like a mini speech, basically. So the type of language she's using is um, kind of, yeah, rhetorical, like speech-based language. So hypophora is where you start with a rhetorical question, so a question that doesn't necessarily have an answer, and then you answer it, even though it doesn't feel like it has an answer. I know that sounds a bit mental, but she says, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. So she answers her own question, and that question is rhetorical, so it doesn't even need an answer, but she answers it herself straight after she's asked it. So it's like saying, do I really need another dress? No, but am I going to buy this one anyway? Yes. You see what I mean? That kind of thing is hypophora. So I'm answering my own question, even though I don't actually need an answer. So it's commonly used in important speeches. And for me, it shows the, the fact that she thinks this is an important subject and this is an important moment in her life. And the poem has this grand feeling or grand nature to it. So um, yeah, that's why she uses hypophora, in my opinion. It's a very catching opening, opening with a question. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a very famous line that I'm not sure if you're if you're kind of into poetry. It's like one of the poems that you come across a lot. My grand's super into poetry, and she got me into poetry, and she was always like quoting the beginning of this poem for some reason, even though she's not like an idealistic love like super love lovey dovey person. Um, it's just one of the ones that got stuck in her head. <laughs> so yeah, it's a uh, it's kind of quite memorable. So asyndetic listing then, if you're not confident with that word asyndetic, just call it listing. If you're really wanting to push yourself, get used to syndetic versus asyndetic listing. I do make lessons on rhetorical and um, poetic devices as well. So have a look at those on the Scribbly course page if you, if you want to push your understanding of those. I'm also writing a book on uh, devices, but it's not out yet. <laughs> it should be out sometime, but yeah, it's taken me ages. It takes a long time to write a book. Yeah, so asyndetic listing, basically that means there's no and. So breath, smiles, tears, rather than breath, smiles, and tears, or breath, and smiles, and tears. There's no conjunctions in the middle. So breath, smiles, tears. 
we are listing these different elements of herself and how they express love. So her breath expresses love every time she breathes. She's kind of exhaling a feeling of love. Every time she smiles, her face is lighting up with love. Every time she cries, even in those tears, there's this emotion that comes from a point of love. Tears is an interesting word to zoom in on because we wouldn't necessarily think of crying as like an emotion that expresses love, but in her mind it does. So you could say maybe that suggests that they don't have a perfect relationship as the rest of the poem is sort of trying to attest to. Or maybe even in the worst moments of her life, she kind of is comforted by him. So it's it's a little bit ambiguous. We're not sure with that one how you're supposed to take it. Along with um, the asyndetic listing, you'll notice there's a line break here. And I was talking about this briefly earlier. So we can talk about that line break. And it just means that there's a slight extra pause between breath and smiles. So it kind of makes you catch your breath in a way, or it gives kind of space within the poem for the idea of a breath. And um, so it makes you kind of think a bit more about that. And it feels a bit breathless as well, like when you're kind of overwhelmed or really giddy or excited or nervous or anxious, that type of feeling. Good, so finally, we're gonna have a look at a little bit of context and themes. Um, if you're doing Elizabeth Barrett Browning as like a bigger project or you're doing A-level maybe, I would suggest going deeper into context and I've tried to give you like a few little context points during this lesson as well that aren't necessarily here. Um, I've kind of like narrowed this down for GCSE students just so that it keeps the lesson to like a normal length rather than my tendency, as you probably notice if you've taken a few classes with me, is I just keep going on and rambling and there's like infinite stuff to say. And it is really fun to do that and that is my tendency. But at the same time, I'm aware that like people watching this, like you guys don't have infinite time to spend on one poem. So I try and create a compromise and a balance. But hopefully, hopefully it's a good length for you rather than like way too long. So context then. It was first published in 1850, which is sort of slap bang in the middle of the Victorian period. So it's a very Victorian poem. It expresses the values and ideas of Victorian society. It also slightly challenges those values, like I was saying, because Victorians aren't supposed to be this gushingly emotional about anything, never mind love and marriage. It's more like practical and serious. That's sort of like how Victorians try and be. So go into that more, like look at Victorians and how they are in this time and help, um, that will help you to contrast what's in this poem with the average Victorian attitude at the time. One thing that is typically Victorian is this religious Christian feeling. Um, so people are very uh, religious and they're very Christian. They're specifically Protestant mostly at this time as well. She kind of does mention saints, which is more of a Catholic idea. So I'm not actually sure whether she was Protestant or Catholic. I'm just gonna look that up now. Just bear with me one second. I hate not knowing stuff when I find out. When I, uh, yeah, if I just come across something, I'm like, hang on, this question's gonna bug me. Yeah, I just uh, paused the videos. I went down a bit of a rabbit hole there to try and find out what religion she is. And she's like, something really weird. Um, sorry if you are this religion, by the way, I've just not heard of it before, but it's called a congregational um, Christian. So it's from what my clumsy reading of it just now for a couple of minutes, it seems like it's a branch of Protestants. It's not Catholic, um, but it's also very private and personal and they have their own uh, beliefs that are not just like a standard Protestant belief. So if you're more interested in the religious sides of her um her upbringing and her beliefs and how those affect this poem. I did not give you a very good <laughs> explanation of her religion just there, and I apologize. So definitely look that up yourself if it's useful for you. So um, yeah, this is this is something that I really love about her, and I just this is my favorite piece of context on Elizabeth Barrett Browning. And actually, I'll just kind of really quickly side uh, sort of segue into the fact that I'm really into her and Robert Browning, as I said earlier, and. Um, if any of you are really interested in this, which is quite nerdy, their house is still existing in the same way that it pretty much was when they lived there in Florence in Italy. 
and I used to live in Italy in Florence and I lived kind of like two roads up from them so I realized that the house was there and it's a museum so you can just go for free I think you have to make an appointment because it's not always open you can go to the house for free you can have a look around and if you're really mental like me and my academic friends you can go and stay there and you can like sleep in the house that they lived in which is sort of it's really cool. It's one of the coolest places I've ever been in my life. I went there in June this year. We were there for like five days, I think, um, cooking in their kitchen, sleeping in their bedroom. It's really odd, but it's really cool. And they have a really beautiful library full of Elizabeth Barrett poems and Robert uh, Robert Browning poems. So it was nice just sitting around and reading like bits of their library, basically. So I really recommend doing that if you're kind of interested in literature and poetry because they're really they're a really cool couple, really interesting. You can read their letters that they wrote to each other and that kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, they had a really crazy life and they Elizabeth Barrett Browning, before she was married to Robert Browning, she was a really famous poet in her own right or poetess, but she led this really trapped, reclusive life where her father was a bit of a kind of dominant figure. And he kind of made her stay in the house and look after him. And she, she was quite sick as well, but he sort of encouraged this idea in her that she shouldn't go out and she shouldn't travel and see any of the world. So her way of existing, I suppose, and like coping with that was to read loads of books and to write poetry, which made her an amazing poet. But also it's kind of sad because she's quite trapped. And Robert Browning read one of her poems. He was a poet himself. He was trying to be he was a lot less famous than her at the time actually and a lot younger I think she was about 40 at this point and he was like 20s late 20s or the early 30s and um yeah and so like he read one of her poems in a magazine and was like this is amazing and then wrote a letter to her and he's like I know this sounds crazy but from your poem I think I'm in love with you and I've always admired your poetry and you're really just like a wonderful person even though we've not met and I feel like we have loads in common and I wrote poetry too and that type of thing and then he sort of ended it by saying anyway do you want to just like run away and get married and go live in Italy and she she wrote a letter back saying yeah sure so um yeah they they agreed to marry and the dad was not happy about it so they just ran away and that's how they ended up in Italy and then they had a kid and they had a really nice life in that flat where I was saying I stayed and so it's like a really beautiful, crazy story. And it's very, very weird for the time. Victorians didn't normally do this. So um, you can see a bit more like how grateful she is because he kind of saved her and he changed her life and he gave her the opportunity to travel and freedom from like this kind of strict ruled place that she was stuck in. So yeah, so from that point of view, I think it's really cute, the poem. That's why I was saying it was cute earlier. So finally, I've kind of written out some notes on themes here, but I always try and end my lesson with, after we've like looked at everything else, I want you to kind of go through the themes yourself and kind of write notes, because it, it just helps you like think about the poem a bit deeper and click with it. So feel free to have a look at my themes here and um, make sure that you've got your own notes on themes as well. You might actually come up with different themes from the ones I've put here too. And finally, make sure you understand the thematic statement, so the message behind each theme. So for example, about death, her message is that death is actually positive because it will enhance their love, it's not a negative thing. So that's kind of weird for a, a modern day audience, but for a Christian audience in Victorian times, they're quite used to that idea. So that message is kind of reinforced as a religious message through her exploration of love. So you want to do that with each theme, just go into the, the ultimate final message behind them. So hopefully you've enjoyed this lesson and my crazy little ramblings about the Brownings in their house. <laughs> and um, yeah, hopefully you don't think this is too soppy and you're quite enjoying this poem. And um, good luck with all your essays and your studying. And hopefully I'll see you guys soon on another lesson. Thank you for listening. <laughs>